so much for coming to Office Hours. This is a program where we invite luminaries from the software world to share insights. They're one-on-one -on -one sessions with experts, and they've been a great success. I'm Lauren Demuse, partner and COO at Theory Ventures, and I'm delighted to introduce our discussion today. Uh, we'll chat in the fireside format for about 40 minutes, and please feel free to ask questions in the chat box, and we'll see if we can intersperse them. To begin, Tom is a uh, general partner at Theory Ventures, uh, our $235 million fund focused on companies leveraging technical discontinuities and to go to market advantages. And prior to founding Theory, Tom spent 14 years at Redpoint as a general partner where he made investments in companies like Looker, Colin knows something about, Customer, and Monte Carlo. Speaking of Colin, we're joined by Colin Zima, co-founder and CEO of Omni Analytics, no stranger to intelligence and data analysis. He's worked on search quality at Google, founded a dynamic pricing company for the restaurant industry, then ran data at Hotel Tonight before becoming a chief analytics officer at Looker through its acquisition by Google. Collins advised many of the world's largest companies on their BI strategy. And so we'll have the chance to dive into this today. I'll hand it over to Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Colin, great to have you on the show. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Happy two year birthday to Omni. We'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can start Chief Analytics Officer, unusual title, and yep. you were in this uh, a different role than most, I think, at, um, at uh, Looker, and it gave you a, a lens into the landscape of BI. Maybe we can start there. What was it like? What did it mean to be CAO? And what did you see, and how did that lead you to start Omni? Um, yeah, I think one of the interesting things, and you see this conversation actually a lot on the internet about like, where do data people land when they want to move into the C-suite? And there's like the idea of the chief data officer is out there, but that takes like almost a very IT spin. When I started talking to Looker, so at Hotel Tonight, Jamie, one of my co-founders at Omni and I, we were customer number four of Looker. And so we were maybe like first, the first two power users of the product that didn't work there, where I was actually just living in the product every single day. And I think over about a year and a half, we had slowly built a lot of conviction that the product was super interesting and that we wanted to spend more time on the Looker side than maybe even on the Hotel Tonight side of the house. And as I was building a relationship with Looker, I just said, hey, I think uh, I can do a lot of different things for you and just add value. But I understand where the company is going from the customer perspective. And so I think I could probably bring that in and help talk to customers and help do everything here. And Frank was kind enough to say, we can find space for you. I think that you can be effective. And so the title was almost like an afterthought in just get this person into the company and have him do things. And that was actually my role for eight years was like gap filler, like super customer person that almost like the other side, the, the customer, our customers could trust to have a real conversation about what they were doing. And so I was just a super user the whole time I was at Looker. Uh, I got to use the product a lot. I eventually took over the product team for a while um, and was able to apply the customer insights to doing product stuff. I was doing customer success, which again, is just communicating what customers are doing. Yeah. So I, I think the simple way to ex describe it was almost like super customer, but it was a really nice actual feed into being the CEO because now at Omni, I'm in a very similar role where it's like a little bit of product, a little bit of customer, but like you're not truly responsible for any of it. Um, and it just provided this really nice view to get to talk to data people about what they were doing every single day. Yeah, I remember you you were the voice of the customer, right? I remember you building that customer success dashboard with all the different activity metrics to, to create the score of who was active and who was not. And you would bring back all of these stories from the field that really informed uh, the product strategy. It was awesome. And so maybe we can use that as a jumping off point to talk about the history of BI, right? I think the way I think about it is like you had that first wave, Cognos, MicroStrategies, Business Objects, Hyperion, and then you had Tableau that maybe my mental model is separated the visualization from the database and the cube. And then cloud databases, cloud data warehouses came out, Looker came in with the modeling layer built on top. And, and now there's Omni. Like, is that the way that you think about how BI has evolved or do you see it differently? It's actually a really funny one because at Looker, we talked about the three waves all the time. And those were our three waves. It was like Cognos Business Objects, MicroStrategy, a throwback to Tableau and like more desktop focused tools. And then Looker was like the cloud version of it. And it's funny because as I've stepped outside Looker and just seen more companies, like everyone has a three wave story where the waves are all slightly different. Like Gartner has one and ThoughtSpot has one. And sort of everyone talks about the evolution. 
So I, I think my view has actually shifted a little bit over time, which is kind of early BI, the database and the BI tool were fairly close, very closely coupled, but they sat central in an organization. The BI tool and the database were big and monolithic, but they were monolithic across all users. And Tableau and a lot of the desktop tools became like a single user empowerment tool where a user could bring a data set and do the things that they wanted to do with it. And I think rather than thinking about it as like distinct waves, I, I've thought about it as an oscillation back and forth from centralization to decentralization, which is there's this constant pull towards data teams that own everything for the organization. So like a really skinny uh, tube that everything goes through that encodes business logic that serves the organization. And as more and more stuff goes through that really skinny pipe, you get a lot more governance and centralization, but the downside is you move a lot more slowly. And it's a little bit by design. And every time that happens, there's a backlash to decentralization and more people doing things in remote ways. And I think in many ways, like that is what made Tableau so successful was you had all these monolithic tools and people just wanted to move really quickly on their own. And in some ways, like Looker was the, the pushback against Tableau and really decentralized BI because people actually wanted centralization. But at the same time, there was this tech shift taking place, which is historically BI was based on compute and storage tied to the BI layer. And Looker was now the separation of it into the cloud data warehouse and the BI tool. And I think what's been interesting is that has just become the de facto way that people do BI now. I was talking to someone from SciSense yesterday and their whole message for 10 years was a centralized sort of like cubing layer, their, their intelligent engine. And his message was even they are focused now on cloud data warehouses for BI as the central way that people do things. So that has become the standard. I think what we're going to see moving forward is a, a move towards actually wanting to balance those things, but also this idea of hybrid computing, which is some things are good in the data warehouse where you need billions of rows to do things and just like massive data volume and centralization. And some things are good on the desktop. There's a reason that Excel and Tableau and bringing data close is really powerful for users. And so I think I can't tell whether we're going to oscillate back to workbook BI again in a new form. Like we see tons of Excel in the cloud type stuff and things like that. But I, I think underneath it, what what we are most convicted on at Omni is that people want to do all of these things at the same time. You want big data and you want small data. You want fast and interactive and you want depth and governance. And so uh, I'm hopeful that we can actually settle in the middle at some point in time, but I, we might just keep oscillating back and forth. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting. That, so it, it's really interesting the way that you describe it, which is it's more a people dynamic than it is a technology dynamic. Yeah. And so like when the cloud data warehouses came out, there was this architectural shift that allowed people to bring back maybe the central data teams to rest control back. And we were at a dinner together. We were, where this debate was happening amongst different heads of data, where we were talking about, do people prefer to have a centralized organization? And the benefit of having a centralized organization is the data is interpreted correctly. It's accurate. There's a certain level of trust within that data, but you move a lot slower. And so it seems like data teams are, they exist on some continuum of how much control, how yep. much teaching they want to do. And, and then the tools grow to fit that individual culture. Is that what you've seen? I think that's exactly right. And I think it actually has ushered in these little platform shifts as well. I think one of the funny things with Looker was we made modeling data so accessible to end users that models actually grew somewhat bloated over time because you had tens or hundreds of people modeling data instead of ones and twos. And in some ways, that's actually what enabled DBT because by moving it into a separate layer, we implicitly put more permissions on top of who can actually model data. Yeah. And so it, it, it's this sort of same oscillation between decentralized and now if only three people can touch the DBT model and you have to make a cube to feed it into the BI tool, like suddenly we've locked it up even more. And I think that what we've seen now have with DBT actually out and implemented and, and other transformation layers too, but implemented for five years for people, they're now feeling stuck in like a more controlled environment where end users feel hamstringed. And so again, I think what the idealized version of the world is actually business logic that can flow between these layers, like transformation that's happening down here that 
actually is understood up at the top layer, as opposed to transformation that's happening at the bottom, that's just a black box, and then you sit another black box on top of it. And the interfaces have broken apart a little bit more, I think, than people intended in the world of like cloud data warehouse BI than in Tableau, where they're coupled together, or even in MicroStrategy, where they were really coupled together. You have these two, these two worlds, you have the data team that wants control and accuracy, and then you have the end users who really want to move fast. Yep. So there's this pendulum going between them where tools have different strengths. And ideally you get to a place where there's some fusion of those two workflows that provides enough flexibility for the end user, but also gives enough governance. And there's, there's like approval processes or controls that rationalize the metrics or the definitions across. I think that's exactly it. I, I think one of the views that I've really leaned into kind of more hard over time is like control is good, but if you think that you are controlling something and the end user doesn't want to be controlled, then you actually don't have the control anyway. They're because just going to find a release valve and go somewhere else. Exactly. What we found is when we took permissions away from users in Looker, that didn't make them have a more permissioned experience. It kicked them out into another workflow where they worked around the entire product. And in some ways, I think that you need to embrace letting users have more space to do things. You just, you need paths to turn that into control and to actually keep it loosely coupled to the things that you're doing. And so our big thesis is by letting end users make a more constrained mess in the analysis layer, we can actually couple it back to the model in a way that's much more interesting versus saying there's a hard wall right here and everything you do on the other side of the wall is your responsibility. Yeah. That creates like that firm disconnect. And I, I think the what I, what I'd add is I think we haven't figured that out in the interface between transformation and the BI layer very well yet. Like that is still very black boxy in between like in database transformation and the BI layer. Again, because JDBC is just the standard, like you make tables show up and then you do things in the BI layer. I think that we're going to need to see like better threads in between those to truly create like an end to end pipeline that works really well. Yeah, there's a pretty hard wall there. You have like permissions at the database layer. You have text. Text to SQL would be another example of a yep. feature that sort of exists at the database layer. And then you also have permissions in text to SQL at, at the BI layer, and they don't necessarily interface. And at least from the conversations we've had, it seems like some teams decide to do it at the database and some teams decide to do it in BI, but it's just, it's not clean. I, this has actually always been one of my frustrations that I've always wondered why BigQuery, Snowflake, Databricks, all the, all the database vendors haven't thought about permissions in a BI centric way. Like the permission model at the database layer is take it or leave it. Like you can off the user all the way down and we won't tell you whether the query will work or not, but we'll run it for you. And in the BI layer, we have to have a higher SLA than that. We can't just have a user show up and have queries randomly failing. But the database has no concept of a user. And I do think the more that those things can actually weave together, the more interesting like the full user experience can be. Because what the end user wants is like ETL database transformation BI yeah. to all feel like one tool. Yeah, exactly. The problem is like the APIs in between them require some like lowest common denominator, which is oftentimes like the dibble. And I think until we, like part of our goal is hopefully we can actually really make those things work well together. And it feels almost like a gen one product and in it's integration, but the parts are all swappable and movable. Yeah, that makes sense. So there's two different parts where you, you, I hear you innovating, right? One is what is the workflow around centralized versus decentralized metrics definition? Maybe we can yep. kind of call it that. And then the second is the interface between the BI system and databases in terms of like authorization and access. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. And one of the things you touched on a little bit before was hybrid execution. Yep. Let's, so new technology, the computers themselves are now super powerful. We're running LLMs locally, the you know 70 billion parameter ones, and they, they fly. The data sets that we typically use are not enormous, but yep. they can be enormous. And so what is hybrid execution? What does that mean for you? And, and how do you see it benefiting Yeah. You? So again, like we've shifted to this world now where in the BI, a lot of people are doing most of their compute in the data warehouse. So it's like dump as much data as you can into BigQuery, Snowflake, Databricks, Redshift, whatever it is, sit a BI tool on top of it, hit those tables, pass SQL down, get results back, serve them in the BI layer. And I, I think what we saw building out those experiences is there's a certain class of queries now that are incredible uh, that have become opened up to users that were never opened up before. Like you can just go query a billion rows or a trillion rows and you can actually do it interactively, which is just like mind boggling 
from a BI perspective. The downside of that is that a lot of them have relatively non-interactive experiences compared to web apps that we're used to. Like when you go use, I'm trying to think of a good example, but when you get all the data back in your, on your desktop in Excel, for example, and you hit enter on a formula, it just works instantaneously. There's almost no sense of compute. And it's because the data is sitting right there. And what was interesting is that in the BI layer, this tended to be a very black and white sort of decision of which mode that you were in. Like you either flipped on the database and you had infinite scale, but a little bit of latency, or you moved everything in memory and you suffered through like a 30 second upfront load and then everything was interactive. And what seems like it's become opened up is now this idea that we can actually have both of these things at the same time. When I need to hit a billion rows in the warehouse in real time, I can drop down to the data warehouse. If I have a result set already, and I know I have that result set, I can just do compute in the browser. And so almost the responsibility now, it's unclear whether the database is gonna solve this problem or the BI layer is gonna have to solve this problem. And in some ways we're trying to do both. But the idea is if I have a small data set and I know I'm going to query it many times, let's suck that thing into the browser. And if I don't, or I need to drill, let's go back to the database. And it's just magic to the end user. There's no knob. It's just optimized for the experience. Makes sense. It's, it's again, like decentralization, centralization. You're decentralizing where the compute is. It can be in the cloud or it can be on my local machine. Yes. For the right experience. And if you have the right governance layer in between to make sure the data is intelligently cached, it's not out of date, it's a good time to live or whatever. It, and I'd add, you need to understand what the data actually means. Like the hard part is that you might be writing different SQL up here and down here for that same data table because you have different SQL engines potentially on top of both. But if you know that a date column is a date column here and like you've got time zone solved and all of that kind of magic underneath, then whether I'm querying up here or down here doesn't matter to the user. I, d I don't care, I just want the results back and now it's almost on the application. And, and again, this is something that software applications need to do. What are we putting in local storage? And what are we actually going back to the database for? We're, that's now becoming like a BI problem is application architecture of where data lives. And the new tools are just incredible for stuff like this. So does that mean you have to get into the business of SQL transpilation and understanding different dialects? In order, or does that live in the model layer? Like where does that at least our argument is yes, you have to start understanding these things. And I, I think the answer is there could be tools that wrap all of these things magically and say, we will transpile the SQL for you. You just hand a SQL and we will go run it in the right place. Yeah. We, we are that tool for ourselves and we just did it out of necessity. If you get a data table back and you want to flip it over to sort or you want to filter it, we just didn't want you to have to go back to the database for that. The question is like, how do we make it so that we can turn that knob up all the way so when you load a certain virtualized view, we know it's small enough to lift it into the browser versus go back to the database. But again, I think this is where you just can't be precious about the actual SQL that's getting written. The dialect almost doesn't matter at some point. It's like the user experience design now, but from a data management perspective. Yeah, I agree. It's really interesting that you talk about, okay, now this layer needs to be responsible for basically the architecture almost like not at a network layer, but like at a logical layer for where the data needs to live in order yep. to live the best experience. That's, and, and I think if you keep walking it forward, what's interesting is if you extend that to the full data pipeline, like all the way back to ETL, we released a little feature that's I'm on a dashboard, you can go bump the ETL cycle and we will suck things out of an API, we'll put it in a database. You may even need to transform it and we've hand waved over that now. You might then want to load it into the browser because you want to slice and dice it, or you just want to get a query result back. But again, like if you think about it all as one problem, it's like a, it's an application architecture decision of how far back you're pushing transformation and data movement yeah. to optimize an end user experience. And I think the mistake that a lot of tools have made is trying to make the user make that decision. Like you build your application. And I think we're going to move to a world where the applications are just smart enough to do the transformation in the right level in the first place. So there's this meme, Ben Stansel talks about it, like the modern data stack is dead. I think one of the prevailing sentiments across data buyers, at least according to our research is don't sell me another tool. And is this, it sounds like this is part of that, the evolution of the ecosystem where we've had a thousand flowers bloom and you really only want a handful in your bouquet. Yeah. And, and I, I think the, the kinder message might be like, 
if any given one of those problems you feel very strongly about, I think that you will be able to swap out those components. But probably the best version comes with a lot of those components out of the box. And again, I think Microsoft has built an ecosystem that looks a lot like this, where it's like, when you go into Azure, you get everything from end to end, and you're probably going to use the box of parts that they handle, they, they hand you, and that's why they've been so successful. But ultimately, you can swap out any given one of them. And fitting in a best of class thing in that stack is a little bit harder. But I think that's the kind of beautiful version of the future is a full stack tool where any piece can be swapped out, but maybe there's a little bit less necessity to go do that. You can, you also see what's happening with Iceberg and Snowflake, where people are deciding actually to segment out so then they can run the query engine on top and decide yep. ultimately what to do. And it seems like, at least according to the last earnings transcript, it's really the bigger companies who are pushing for that, the more sophisticated companies, and they're looking for more specialized stacks. But you definitely want a sane set of defaults for most users. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the future of BI. Clearly, there's this pendulum swinging back and forth. We want to enable both parallel work streams between a centralized uh, data team and then the end user. We wouldn't be living in 2024 if we didn't talk about AI. Where, yep. where does, what does AI mean in BI? These systems are non-deterministic. If you ask it one plus two enough times, it'll tell you the wrong answer. Yeah, and- I'm, I'm forming like I'm getting my talk track slowly on the AI <laughs> side of the house for us. But we have a a, a two-part view for AI. So the first one is that I think the current most successful implementations of AI that people are actually using on a daily basis actually look a lot more like co-pilots than full applications. And so I think we've dropped in a couple of these into the application. So we have one, we have an Excel layer where people could just write formulas in actually Excel's dialect. And what's nice is we went to go copy Excel's dialect just so people wouldn't have to learn a new dialect but it turns out that people that LLMs also speak Excel really well. And so we actually have a chat bot where you can say, parse out the domain from an email address. And it just magically writes like a mid left, right split function and spits it out in Excel. And I think there will be these small co-pilots all over the application. So another one that we talked about is people want to filter data by time. And this is one that I've been hammering my team on recently. And they want to say in the last month or in the last 42 days or whatever. And you often are building a UI widget to control that. So there's a drop down and there's a set of things. Text is a great way to say, I want to start three weeks ago and go two days into the future and put that into a bot and have it turn into time. And I feel like those will be sprinkled all throughout applications as just alternative interfaces to small pieces of UI. So like viz builders and filter objects and formula builders and things like that. So I think those are going to become omnipresent in all the applications that we're using, almost just better search boxes all over the place. The other one is open end LLM analytics, do my job for me or like help me write queries. And I think our very simple point of view is it requires a level of governance underneath it where the user can actually interpret the results more than a black box and interact with them. So the example is always show me growth for the last 30 days. It's very easy for both uh, a very junior analyst or an LLM to split out a time series with counts next to it. The hard thing is to actually interpret those results and live with them on an ongoing basis. And I feel like the successful implementations of these in BI will have to merge with the idea of semantics in the data warehouse so that they can be governed and touched after they're presented back to the user. So our idealized workflow would be in a text box to get you started. But then when you need to refilter the result set, you can actually do that with UI and interpret the result set through UI. And so I think that's probably how these types of things will get deployed in a BI context. Yeah, I really like what you said, like the UI acceleration of the copilot. How do I navigate a more complex query or I don't really want to learn the menus. So how do I configure a chart in order to that seems that's, that's what we're doing with Copilot today when we code, right? That's what happens. And I, I agree with you. Like the semantic layer, uh, I think, must exist in order to simplify sort of the scope of the inputs for the LLM and then narrow the scope of output so you get a higher level of, of accuracy. My favorite experience with AI right now is Gemini. When you ask it a question, you can hit the little G at the bottom and it will validate the results. And you need those sorts of feedback loops and levels of sophistication, particularly, I think, when you're analyzing data because you need to have confidence in it, right? That's, yeah, it, but like, and the 
debugability matters, but like in a way that's almost intrinsic. The example that I love to give, because we've been playing with these things a lot, is if you use time in the database, like we've, we've, we wrote a 12 page blog post about how time is frustrating in the database. And the reason is because there's actually a lot of nuance to what even writing March 15th means. What time zone are you in? How are you transforming? Is it different user to user? And again, if you, an LLM can return a valid result set that will have dates on it and counts. But as soon as you actually start like introspecting those things and you need to pivot it by time, or you're actually trying to compare it year over year, like those time zone things start to matter. And so much of BI is actually building control interfaces for those sorts of concepts, like building control for what time means in the app. And it's like hooking those two things together that actually creates the value in like the experience. And then it just really just becomes a UI on top of like these logical controls. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And so do you think, where will the semantic, so do you think there'll be a semantic, will, will AI catalyze the creation of a semantic layer? I, I, this is a hard one because in our experience, the easiest way to make semantics is to actually do it in the workflow of building analyses. Hooking the BI layer to the semantic layer was, I would say, the genius thing that Looker unlocked. It wasn't yeah. LookML by itself. It was the workflow from LookML to a dashboard and actually linking those things together. In some ways, I think it needs to be very tightly coupled with a BI layer because you need to build it in doing something versus data engineering in a headless way. I think the question is, will customers trust a, a BI layer, semantic layer, or does it need to be independent for some particular reason? And I don't know, but maybe just they're, they're not easy enough to interface with in other places, and that needs to give people confidence. But I, I, I think the idea of headless semantics is really tricky because now like every problem has two problems associated with it as opposed to one tool yeah. that can actually solve both of the problems. We have a question from the audience from Nestor, Colin. Talking about AI, one feature I see missing is understanding the context or type of data and suggesting yep. different analyses. Most users don't know what to do with the data they load. Is that something that you see? I think a little bit. It's an interesting question because there probably are things like time series analysis and like distributions and things like that. I, the, the thing I would say is there's a really bifurcated world between profiling a new data set and doing business analytics that I think get conflated together. And honestly, we had this problem early. Like we wanted to build all the cool like profiling stuff. And it just, it turns out that you're not working with a completely new data set that frequently in a BI context. And a lot more of your problems are like, I have Salesforce data and I'm trying to do a thing where like the data shape and what the user wants are actually really hard to fit together. And so I think in some ways it's a problem of focus. Like, which of these types of problems are you caring most about building your user interface for? But like in event data, for example, I think that's probably a really important type of use case because you tend to be working with raw, dirty data. But I, I think that tends to lean almost more to the data science side of the house in terms of like profiling, doing net new things. Like my end users, because I do the BI at Omni, like they're not trying to work with net new tables, really. Like they're trying to just understand the marketing data, understand sales data, understand a new product data set. So that just hasn't been a big problem for us, probably. Makes sense. Thanks for the question, Nestor. Can we, Colin, can we talk about embedded analytics? So this was a big part of Looker's business. It was, yep. I want to call it, at least from the board's point of view, an effortless part of the business where there was just a lot of pull from the market and produced lots of ARR. How do you think about like the future of, of embedded BI? Does it change with like these governance dynamics or with AI or the semantic layer as much as interactive BI? So I don't, I, I think the interesting thing is almost the, I, I wouldn't say that it's changing. It's just right. become so easy to do that I think that now everyone is considering it where it was viewed as like a very expensive decision to make in the past. So I think before building the analytics portion of your app was a big lift. Like you had to think about data management and like all these things and you had to build a stack for it. And I can just tell you when we built ours, and again, like we're a BI company, so we're cheating a little bit, but I literally pinged our PM and I said, we've already got all of our data in Snowflake. Can we just go embed a dashboard in our app right now? And she had something built in a day. And I, I think a lot of it is just like the bar has been reduced because getting data into a database is really easy. 
putting a BI tool on top of it is not that hard either. And then embedding it in a website is not that hard either. Now, there's a question of like how composed do you want that experience to be? Because the experience can range all the way from I'm dropping an iframe in a website. It's not as custom. It's really simple to I am building a true, complete data application. And I'm essentially just a software developer that's been given a data backbone. Mm -hmm. There's a big lift over here and there's a very small lift over here. But I think the thing that's been interesting now is 10 person companies are comfortable embedding analytics now. It's a pricing problem, actually, more than it's a data management problem. So I think if anything, it's going to keep accelerating. I think the question is, can we build product that actually feels great for the end user? A lot of the challenge that we ran into with Looker was the product wasn't architected to do that. So all these things that we're talking about with hybrid execution and page loads and things like that, the product wasn't fully optimized for all of that stuff. It was really good from an API perspective, but like not very good from like a lightweight drop-in perspective. And so I think we have like a little bit of a shift in how we're trying to do it, but I think that there's almost no excuse to, for your customers not to have a, like all the data that they could want in the app. It's, it, it takes a week to go drop that thing in now. Yeah. And it's also as an upsell, if you're a SaaS vendor, I think there's real value there. Uh, yeah. I, it, and I always advise there's almost two versions of it. One is the upsell side. The right. other is the way that you show your value is by expressing it back with data. Like, uh, we have a lot of customers that probably don't know how much time they're spending in the app, but when we embed it back and say, Hey, you spent 40 hours this month in the product, it starts like demonstrating the value more clearly. And it helps them demonstrate to their customers how much value they're producing. Like a lot of your goal as a SaaS vendor is helping your buyer be successful and be a champion in their job. And data is like a really, a very simple way to do that. Show people that they're getting value out of your product. So I remember there's a man named George who was COO and at Salesforce and then COO at Twilio. And I remember meeting him and this might've been 10 years ago. He said something that stuck with me ever since. He said, people buy software for a report. <laughs> there's like some data output about the value that you've created. That is the byproduct that, that, that ultimately is what they're buying. It's I, yeah. I go back to the consumer versions of this. Like when you get the Spotify, you're in review. Like part of it's cool and part of it is like, oh, wow, I use this product a lot. Like this product is a meaningful part of my life. And it's like such a low bar now for every single product to do that back to you. And so, yeah, I, I think it's going to be just become commonplace for every single software developer to do it. Makes sense. What do you think, given all the advances that we're talking about with the dynamics around self-service and governance, AI, so lowering the barrier to entry, embedded BI that we were just talking about analytics, do you think there are more BI users in the future or fewer, right? There's this question like, does AI automate a lot of the things? And... Yeah, I'm definitely not on the side of AI automating the things away. I, yeah. I think it's like more people are using BI in ways they don't realize is probably the, the most salient answer for me. I don't think the world's going to change from the people that are very compelled to do analysis and the people that are not very compelled to do analysis, yeah. but reducing friction always drives more consumption. And so the question is like, how much of the friction can we actually pull out? And the friction comes in many forms. Pricing is a form of friction. So if the tools feel expensive, people aren't going to use it. But also user experience is a friction. All these things are a friction. Like Google is still increasing in number of searches over time. And it's because they're reducing the friction that it requires to actually ask questions. And I think all of these are monotonically increasing forever type things. It's just what is the slope going to look like? Yeah, that's right. How can we continue? How can we continue to reduce friction? All this, and this is what you were going back to, right? With the vertical integration or quasi vertical integration of the stack, providing the best interface to the end user, reducing the latency. Yep. And we know from Google, right? About 100 milliseconds of latency has a meaningful impact and underlying. It's really funny. One of the first things that I was really compelled to do with Omni is we have a mode where when you click on fields, we'll actually just automatically run the query. We were terrified to do that at Looker because it's like, <laughs> oh no, it could run, it could have costs in the data warehouse. I've become so intolerant to having to hit the run button now when it gets turned off. And it's, it's a perfect one of those examples where like you reduce the latency a little bit and you almost can't go back to, to like another version of the world. And that's like a completely minor user experience. No, so I remember that there's that GIF where they introduce like a hundred milliseconds or 500 milliseconds of latency, someone eating with a fork and then the food moves around and the peas move and it's impossible. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. 
Colin, I really want to thank you for this. I of learned course. a lot. I think the three things I learned was that there is this pendulum between governance and self-serve, and hopefully the breadth of that pendulum swing is becoming narrower and narrower with things like Omni. The second is there's this dynamic with centralization and decentralization, hybrid execution at the edge, which allows super interactive user experience. And then the third, and I think the thing that I, we're both really excited about is that as these experiences improve, the number of people who benefit and can access data in meaningful ways only increases. Yep. Well, thanks very much for joining us on Office Hours, Colin. Thrilled to be partners with you. And again, happy birthday to Omni. Thank you. I love working with you. So it's for another 10. <laughs> Let's go for another 10. That's right. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.